had been taken. So I chose Ananda, and I'll explain why this evening. He was a member of the Gotama clan. He was one of the Buddha's cousins. Uh, there's some question as to whether he was the Buddha's age or younger. Um, you read Helmut Thakkar's book on the Great Disciples. He tends to draw largely on the later parts of the canon and on the commentaries to talk about the different disciples. And I thought tonight I would focus more on what we can learn about Ananda from the, what are generally regarded to be the earlier parts of the canon to give a different perspective on him. Um, the Vinaya says that he left with some of his brothers and other cousins, um, Padiya, Anuruta, Devadatta, to ordain. And they went along with their, their barber, Ubali. And at one point they took off all their ornaments and had Ubali shave their heads and everything. And then said, okay, you can take our ornaments and go back home and report to our, our families that we've decided to ordain. And Ubali said, they could kill me if I did that, so can I go ordain with you too? <laughs> <laughs> And they, they reflected for a bit, and yes, they, yeah, our, our, our relatives are pretty, pretty ruthless. They might kill you, so yeah, come along with us. And then they decided among them that they would have Ubali ordained first, so that from this point on they would have to bow down to him, rather than his bowing down to them. The, um, goes that Padia and Anuruta both became arahants. Devadatta, of course, he has his own history, which maybe someone else will talk about. Um, Ananda gained what is called the gained the Dharma eye. In other words, he gained his first taste of awakening, listening not to the Buddha give a talk, but to a man, a monk named Buna Mandani Buddha. The talk was on applying the three perceptions of inconstancy, stress, and not self to the five aggregates. Verses in the Taragata say that this happened 25 years before the Buddha's passing away. The same verses said that it was at that year that Ananda also became the Buddha's attendant. There are some stories in the canon about some of the Buddha's previous attendants and some problems they had. There was one whose name was Megya, who one day went, was attending to the Buddha and, and said, you know, I'd really like to go off and have some time to meditate on, on my own. And the Buddha said, could you please stay here for a while? And Megya says, no, please, 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 can I go meditate? So the Buddha says, well, what can I say? And so Megya goes off and then he has a horrible meditation. And he comes back and the Buddha basically says, see, I told you. <laughs> Another time. Nagasamala, and another monk was the Buddha's attendant, and they came into disagreement as to which road to go. The Buddha said, no, we'll go this way, and the Nagasamala said, no, this is the way we go. And he got so upset with the Buddha that he finally put the Buddha's bowl down and said, okay, you can carry your bowl if you want, I'm going this the way I want to go. In his case, he actually got beaten up by thieves. Um, so the Buddha apparently s said, okay, I need a permanent attendant, someone I can rely on, and so he chose Ananda. Um, and later on, the Buddha cited Ananda as being foremost in five areas among the Buddhist disciples, um, more than any other monk. He was the most learned, he had the best memory, he had a quis quick grasp and understanding of the implications of a teaching. He was steadfast, and also he was outstanding in being the Buddha's attendant. And we look at other passages in the canon, it turns out that he did not do this duty all on his own. It was probably he was in charge of a team of people who looked after the Buddha. Um, and there's a lot of praise of Ananda in the, ca in the canon. There's one place where Ananda gives an answer to a particularly difficult question, and after he leaves, the Buddha turns to the monks and says, even though he's still not fully awakened, it would be hard to find someone who is equal in, is equal in discernment. Um, before the Buddha died, Ananda went off that last night and went off to cry because he realized, okay, here's the Buddha dying, and I still haven't gained full awakening yet, and he's kind of in despair. So. The Buddha calls for him and basically says, oh, don't worry, you will gain full awakening. And then he turned to the, the assembly and said, Ananda is wise. He knows this is the time to approach to see the Tathagata, this is the time for monks, this is the time for nuns, this is the time for lay male followers, this is the time for female lay followers, this is the time for kings and their ministers, this is the time for sectarians, this is the time for the followers of sectarians. Then he goes on to say that Ananda had these amazing and astounding qualities. One, when people approach to see Ananda, they are gratified at the sight of him. Two, if he speaks Dharma, they are gratified with what he says. And three, before they've had enough, he stops. <laughs> In other words, he knows when to <laughs> not to talk on and on and on. He finally did give, get awakened in the evening before the first council. This was several months after the Buddha's passing. The monks were concerned that the Buddha's teachings might get scattered and not have a, a standard form. And all the other members of the first council were ahants, and they basically said to Ananda, okay, you've got to meditate more so you can join us. And so the very last night before the, the meeting, Ananda was meditating way late into the night, 
um, passed, as I say, he passed much of the night in mindfulness immersed in the body. But as dawn neared, thinking, I'll lie down, he still hadn't gained awakening. He climbed his body. Before his head, fit, head hit the pillow and after his feet left the ground, he gained awakening. So he joined the meeting as an arahant. At the First Council, he was asked to recite the Dharma, and his version then became the standard that, uh, around which the rest of the Pali began to form. However, some monks were not happy with Ananda's, um, some of the things that Ananda had done during the Buddha's life, and they actually imposed offenses on him, offensive wrongdoing for asking for women's ordination, for not asking the Buddha to remain for the full extent of his lifetime, for not asking when told that minor rules might be revoked by the, if the Sangha wished, not asking what a minor rule was and for stepping on the Buddha's wading cloth while he was sewing it. So sewing it. <laughs> Nanda said that even though he did not see that these actions were offenses, he would confess the offenses as a mark of respect for the Sangha. This shows an important part of his character that we're going to discuss further on in the evening, that he was extremely respectful of the rest of the monks. Even though he had a special position, he never used his special position to lord it over the monks. Um, the canon that's, doesn't say when he passed away. The commentary said he passed away at the age of 120. And apparently um, there were two, f two members of the Gotama clan that wanted to have his relics. And so what he did was he went to the rivers that separated their territories. He levitated over the river, and then his relics fell half on one side and half on the other side. That's commentary, and it's typical of the commentary, that kind of <laughs> amazing events. Our main debt to Ananda, of course, is that he memorized so many of the Buddha's teachings. Um, they're, they're huge, you know, they sat out of... Eight, eight, Someone once did an analysis of the canon saying that there are 84,000 parts to the suttas and that Ananda memorized 82,000 of those. So for a large part of what we know about the Buddha had to teach comes through Ananda. And what's particularly interesting is the format in which he did this. We can compare this the way he would pass on the teachings to the way Sariputta did. When Sariputta describes the Dharma or explains the Dharma, he tends to explain it trying to show how one Dharma teaching relates to another Dharma teaching and how they logically fit together. Ananda's approach is different. He basically is kind of with who came to the Buddha, what question did they have, uh, what was their problem, how did the Buddha address their particular problem. So if you compare the two types of presenting presentations of the Dharma, on the one hand, Sariputta, if you see the Buddha as a doctor, Sariputta basically lays out the course of, you know, a course in medicine. Whereas Ananda gives examples, this is how the doctor treated this illness, this is how the doctor treated that illness. Um, and it's an important contribution to our understanding of how the Dharma is taught, because so much of it is dependent on who asks what, what kind of Dharma teaching is best for them. And so we've got a lot of examples of how the Buddha dealt with people of, of all kinds. Uh, we, the suttas give us an opportunity to see how the Buddha taught, what kind of people brought what kind of questions. You can compare the suttas that Ananda seems to be responsible for to the suttas in the Sutta Nabata, which apparently came prior to Ananda's standardization of the Dhamma. And in the Sutta Nabata there are questions, but you don't know who's asking the questions, where they're coming from. Um, and sometimes it's just a question is posed to the Buddha, and it's a series of um, unrelated questions. But in this, in this particular case, and many times in the suttas, you have a person who asks a question, the Buddha gives an answer, that person then pursues the issue. And you get an example of more of a back and forth of how the, the Dhamma gets passed on. Ananda also had a strong sense of which kind of people use which kind of speaking style to indicate their personality. This is something we tend to miss in the translations, because a lot of the translations, you know, the translator sounds like the translator talking to the translator. There's very little sense of whose personality is being expressed. Um, one of my favorite series of, um, or two particular suttas where this is pretty striking, in Majjhima 90 you have King Basenidi coming to ask questions of the Buddha. And Basenidi is kind of like the George Bush of the, of the ancient Buddhist world. He has trouble forming complete sentences. <laughs> And his questions often don't follow on one another. He asks a question of the Buddha, and the Buddha says, why did you ask that question? And then it turns out he has another totally different question in mind. And then he, the, poor, the poor king, he can't really follow through. The next question is done then totally unrelated, and the next question totally unrelated. And at the end, each time the Buddha answers, Pasenity says, well, that makes sense. But he never really has an opportunity to take it in, because there's a question going on in the background of the sutta that 
some misinformation had been reported about the Buddha, and Basenid wants to get to the bottom of this. And so one person accuses another person of doing it, so the other person has to be called in. When he finally comes, he says, I never said that. In fact, it was the other person who made the, who, who made the, the, the accusation, who made this, brought this false information in. And Basenid is never able to get to the, to the bottom of this. And then one of his attendants comes and says, before anything has really been concluded, it's time to go. And so it's basically a satire on, you know, we think the life of a king would be a good life. Well, here's someone who, because he's a king, can never really learn the Dharma. And the personality gets portrayed in the course of the sutta. There's another one, Majjama 95, where this hotshot um, Brahmin teenager comes to see the Buddha. And again, it, it's the way he expresses his question. The, the, the kid is really obnoxious. He, you know, for me, I would kick him. Um, the Buddha doesn't kick him, he actually gives him answers, but it um, gives you an idea of the personalities, and it, it makes the Dharma that much more human as we see it in this kind of presentation. Um, this relates to a particular a concept which I think we should um, know more about in the West. In Thailand, when they talk about the Dharma, they pair the word Dhamma with Atta, A-T-T-H-A. And the word Atta means meaning and it also means purpose. You know, what is the meaning of the teaching and also what is the purpose? It, the two of them go together. Exactly what is this teaching trying to accomplish? It's not simply a matter of what, how you explain the teaching in other words, but exactly what happens when you actually put this teaching into practice. What is the goal of having this particular teaching? And Ananda and Atta, excuse me, uh, Sariputta approach this in two different ways. For Sariputta it's a matter of finding the meaning, seeing it how it fits in with other concepts. Um, for Ananda, it's a matter of how does this relate to a particular personal problem that people might have. And so I think we have a, um, an important aspect of the Dharma that we would have missed otherwise if we hadn't had it presented in this particular way. And, so, and particularly seeing, seeing how a particular teaching fits into an answer for a particular problem. And this is something that tends to get under stress is when the Buddha is saying a particular teaching, what's the question he's answering? And he himself said it's important to realize that when he answers questions, he has four particular ways of answering questions. There's um, the questions that should be given a straight categorical answer, you know, yes, no, this is the way things are. An analytical answer where the, the question is not quite well framed and the Buddha has to reframe the question before he's going to answer it. And the third one is the question with counter questioning. Before he answers the question, he wants to make sure you have an understanding of a particular concept or a particular analogy that he is then going to use to explain, explain the teaching. He wants to make sure you're, you're on board with him, basically, first, before he answers the question. And then there's the fourth kind of question, which the Buddha just puts aside. And there's, he said, it's not worth asking. And it's important to realize this, because there are a lot of questions that Buddhist teachings were later used to answer, which the Buddha himself put aside. And the important one, of course, is the teaching on not-self. Ultimately became a, an answer to the question, is there a self or is there no self? And in the, in the suttas, in fact, there's one I'll be talking about in a minute, the Buddha actually refuses to answer that question. And the person who asked the question gets upset and leaves. You know. And so Ananda, being Ananda, says, you know, why didn't you answer the question? And, the Buddhist, and then the Buddha explains why either answer yes or no to that question would lead to, give rise to a wrong view. Now, unfortunately, that sutta gets kind of pushed aside, as in later generations, and people begin to come up and say, well, the Buddhist teaching on not self means basically the answer to the question, is there a self, is there no self? No, there is no self. And it's important to realize the Buddha never answered that question. So it's important to realize that the Dharma is in response to certain questions, so certain teachings are in response to certain questions. and also to certain types of people. Um, this relates to Ananda's own appearance in the suttas, which is corroborated in the Vinaya. It allows us to get a sense of his personality as well. He is extremely gentle, approachable, and very conciliatory. There's one sutta where the Buddha's mother, who is at that point a nun, comes in and says, I've made this robe for you, accept it. And the Buddha says, no, give it to the Sangha. And she says, you accept it. And he says, give it to the Sangha. You accept it. And Nanda comes in and says, Come on, she's your mother. And she, you know, she did all these things for you. And then the Buddha turns to him and says, Look, you know, if she really wants more merit, give it to the Sangha. Giving it to the Buddha is less merit than giving it to the Sangha as a whole. And then he gives us a long teaching on recipients of gifts. So we see Ananda's you know, 
efforts to be conciliatory. He's also easily moved. There's, um, there's one point where Sariputta is saying, he reflected one day, that he realized that there was nothing that would cause him any grief. And then immediately he says, well, that was something happened to the Buddha. Wouldn't that cause you any grief? And the Sariputta would say, I would reflect that it's, it's a sad thing that such a great person has, has to die, but this is the nature of all things that are conditioned. And Ananda has an interesting comment. He says, it's a sign you have no conceit. In other words, Sariputta's own need for the Buddha there is no longer there. He's not thinking about his need for the Buddha. <coughs> Ananda, however, was very strongly dependent on the Buddha. A similar incident happens when Sariputta himself actually dies. Ananda goes and reports that his death to the Buddha. And he says, you know, it's like everything just became dark to me and I lost my sense of, you know, north and south. And the Buddha has to comfort him, say, look, have I ever said that, you know, there's something that's born is not going to is not going to die. This is the nature of things to pass away. And then he goes on to say, when Sariputta died, did he take virtue with him? Did he take concentration with him? Did he take wisdom and discernment with him? No, these things are still there. So we see that Ananda himself is a very, very sensitive sort of person. And at the same time, he's extremely humble. There's a, uh, one of the more striking of his verses reported in the Tarakata. He says, Whoever of great learning, on the basis of his learning, would despise one of little learning, is like a blind person holding a lamp. You know, for him, the fact that he has all this learning is no, you know, no reason to look down on other people. He's more interested in being of service. Um, but I think the most important part of the, of the suttas, as I said earlier, is this issue of the questions that the Buddha would answer, his strategies for answering the questions. He gives that list of the four types of questions, but never explains them. However, if you look in the suttas that we have from Ananda, you can see these are the kinds of questions that he answered categorically, these are the kinds of questions he answered analytically, these are the ones he answered cross questions, these are the ones he put aside. And you begin to see there are patterns there. And it gives you a good lesson in this is how the drama is applied to when someone comes with a question. Is this a question that's really worth answering, or do you have to probe a little bit more, or can you just answer straight off, or can you just put it aside? And we get to see the Buddha in action through this format of presenting the, the teachings. So that's our primary debt to Ananda. Is he learned, he gave us the teachings in a form that allow us to see the Dharma as it is a part of an interpersonal relationship. And the give and take of a particular person with a particular question with someone who's awakened, and how the awakened person would respond. And it's, it's for teachers in, in later generations, that's an excellent guide. Other debts that we have to Ananda is that he asked questions of the Buddha that nobody asked, nobody else asked, and they sparked the Buddha to explain things or do things that he might not otherwise have done or explained. For example, um, as I said earlier, when the Buddha said, refuse to answer that question, is there self, is there no self, Ananda could have left it just at that, but no, he said, I want to know, why did you answer the question? And so the Buddha explains. Okay. To say, yes, there is a self, sides with, excuse, uh, sides with eternalism, which is a wrong view. To say there is no self, sides with annihilationism, which is also a wrong view. And that, of course, raises the question, well, what is the not-self teaching for? And that forces us to look back on, well, when does the Buddha use this? And it's in the, usually in that questionnaire is something, say, like form or feeling. Is it constant or inconstant? Well, it's inconstant. Is it something inconstant? Is it easeful or stressful? It's stressful. And then, instead of coming to the conclusion that there is no self, the Buddha says, is it worth calling yourself, i.e., not self, is a value judgment? Is this worth clinging to? And it will turn out that there are some times when yourself is actually something you cling to. And when the Buddha says you need to take yourself as your governing principle or yourself as your mainstay, you need to have a sense of yourself as responsible, competent, able to do this practice, and someone who will benefit from this. It's when that those senses of self are no longer needed, that's when you put them all aside. So it gets the kind of idea that this, the teaching is more strategic. It's not just taking a position and saying, okay, from here on in, anybody who says a self, we're going to argue with them. No, he's basically, you use the teaching on that self to ask yourself, when is something worth holding to? When is it worth putting aside? So that, that's an important insight that we get. And it comes from the fact that, Buddha, that Ananda asked the Buddha these questions. Um, there's also passages where Ananda asks, what is this word emptiness? And it turns out nobody else ever asked the Buddha. 
And so you know, the, an Ananda asks them in two contexts. One, he asks them, you know, the one that, when the Buddha says that the world is empty, what does this mean? And the Buddha says it means empty of self or anything pertaining to the self. World here meaning the six senses. So in that case, emptiness means emptiness of a sense of self, or something that would be worth calling self. But there's another one where the, he says, you know, I hear that you one time said that you dwell in emptiness. And what does this mean? And the Buddha basically gives a description of meditation practice where you you know, get into one state of concentration and you realize that getting into concentration, your mind is empty of the disturbances that would have been there if you're not concentrated. And then as you go to deeper stages of concentration, then it gets more and more empty of what was in the previous state of concentration. And then finally, you get to the point where the mind is empty of defilement. So here it is, emptiness does, has another meaning, which means empty of disturbance. And it's something that you pursue as you go through meditation. So we owe those understandings to the fact that Ananda asked those questions. Um, he asked questions about what does the word becoming mean? He asked questions about when, a con when an arahant is practices concentration, what is it like? Um, um, there's a series of questions in Majjhima 106 when he asked the Buddha, you know, when you gain the states of high concentration, is that equivalent to nirvana or not? And the Buddha says no, because they're even in the highest stages of concentration. It may be just equanimity left there, but there's still a clinging to the equanimity, which is something you've got to go beyond. So again, and they, Ananda makes an interesting point. He says, the Buddha teaches us to go across the, the flood, first depending on one thing, from one dependency to another, until we get to the other side. Um, and this is similar to the image of the raft. You hold on to the raft until you get to the other side. But here Ananda's putting attention on the fact that it's what everybody else likes to focus on the fact is that when you get to the other side, you can let go of the raft, you don't have to carry it on your head. What everybody forgets is if you're going to go across the river, you've got to hold on to the raft. And so you need to depend on one state of concentration, going to the next state of concentration. There will be a, there will be a clinging there, but the clinging eventually can be pried away so that, you, that this, this practice of concentration, the practice of the path, can get you over to the other side. There are a couple of times when Ananda and the Buddha were walking along, and the Buddha would smile. And Ananda would say, okay, the Buddhas don't smile without a reason. So I asked him what he's smiling about. And my favorite incident of this is the story of this person called Gawesin. And he says, under a previous Buddha, at this spot, there was a, a householder. He was the head of the village. His name was Gawesin. And he announced to the other members of the village, okay, from now on in, I'm going to observe the five precepts. And the other villagers say, okay, we'll do that too. And then Gawesin goes off to think, wait, wait a minute, no, I'm, I'm not special anymore. Okay, I'm going to observe the eight precepts, okay? We're going to do that too. I'm going to ordain. We're going to do that too. <laughs> I'm going to practice. We're going to practice too. Gawesin becomes an arahant. They become an arahant, okay? End of contest. <laughs> and so here's the use of, we'll be get, getting on this is issue a little bit further below, of using something that is unskillful, i.e., competitiveness, as actually a, a, a skillful means on the path. There are also cases um, when people would bring questions to Ananda, and then Ananda would usher them in to see the Buddha, and so okay, this merits talking to the Buddha. One of the most interesting ones is in Majjhima 136, uh, and a young monk is asked a question about what are the results of karma, and he says the results of karma are stress. And this, the person who asks the question said, wait a minute, I've talked to other Buddhist monks in the past. That's not how they answer. You better go check with the Buddha. And so the monk goes in, he sees Ananda. Ananda takes him in to see the Buddha. And the Buddha says, you fool, when you're asked about karma, you, you reply that it depends on the skillfulness of the karma, whether that's going to lead to pleasure or, or, or pain. And Udayan, another monk, steps in. He says, wait a minute, maybe he's thinking about the fact that all, you know, all the aggregates, all things compounded, are stressful. All feelings are stressful. Therefore, if karma re results in feeling, it must result in stress. The Buddha turns to him and says, you're a fool too. <laughs> That's not the teaching you apply with the teaching on karma. Which again gives you an idea where the teachings apply, where they don't apply, which questions they do and do not apply to. In this case, you're asking about karma, you don't talk about, gee, everything is imper impermanent, stressful, not self. So you know, your karma is not self, everything is not self. 
No, you hold on to the fact that okay, you have to be skillful in your actions to get the kind of results that you would really want. Okay. In terms of things that Ananda actually got done by asking the Buddha, the pr primary one, of course, is women's ordination. You know, the Buddha's stepmother comes, wants to ordain, the Buddha says no. She comes back again, she's shaved her head, she's wearing robes, she's crying, she wants to ordain. And the Buddha again says, no. And then to realize, okay, for the Buddha to allow women's ordination, he's going to need a reason. Because he basically, you know, the question came up, why did you allow this? He said, well, my mother was crying. That would not fly with the rest of the monks. So Ananda says, if women got to be ordained, could they attain the noble attainments? Well, yes. Okay, then you, here's, his, here's his clue. For this reason will you ordain them. And that's when the Buddha says yes. So it's through Ananda asking that question that we got women's ordination. Another issue was at the very end of his life, he asked the Buddha, you know, how, do you care for, how do we care for the Buddha's body? And the Buddha says, monks don't have to worry about that, the lay people will take care of that. And then Ananda, of course, says, well, anyway, how do the lay people do it? Then he's able to give the instructions. So after the Buddha dies, then Ananda says, okay, this is what has to be done. He takes care of the funeral. Um, there are times in the suttas where Ananda appears as a straight man. In other words, he asks stupid questions. And the fact, the fact that he himself reported this, I think, is a really attractive part of his personality. Um, he comes in and tells the Buddha, hey, this admiral for friendship, this is half of the holy life. And the Buddha says, no, it's the whole of the holy life. And then he explains what he means. If, it had, if we didn't have a teacher who was a truly admirable friend, nobody would be practicing. It's not the case that the, your admirable friend will do it for you, but the fact that we have the Buddha as our admirable friend is why we're able to practice. Um, there's another place where he comes in and says, you know, this dependent core rising, this is really clear and obvious. And the Buddha says, no. <laughs> it's because it's so complex that people are still going around and around and around in the cycle. And then he gives this extremely long discourse on dependent core rising, uh, which is one of the, and, and it clarifies a lot of issues in the course of it. Um, there are a couple of cases where monks come to visit, and they sit down and they're meditating, and Ananda says, you know, to the Buddha, uh, why aren't you welcoming them? And the Buddha stays silent. And he asks them three times, and finally the Buddha comes out of meditation. He said, we're all in meditation, communicating through our meditation. So, so it gives you an idea that there's other levels going on besides just what's on the surface. There are a couple of places where Mahagasapa criticizes Ananda. One in particular, after the Buddha passed away, Ananda took a large group of young monks into the wilderness, and they all ended up disrobing. And so the, the Mahagasapa says, you know, this youngster doesn't know his, 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 um, his, his abilities. And Ananda says, you know, I've, I have gray hairs on my head. <laughs> and then and the Mahagasapa says, look, if you're going to take people out in the wilderness, you have to know what you're doing. So again, Ananda was re willing to accept criticism from the other monks. He never took the fact that he was the Buddha's cousin, or he never took the fact that he was the Buddha's attendant, to place himself above criticism. Having asked all these questions while the Buddha was alive, Ananda himself then became a real source of knowledge afterwards. And some of the, his, answers, his, his answers to questions afterwards show that how much he was able to learn from the Buddha by uh, asking him questions. And his answers are interesting, both in terms of the content of the answers he gives and also in terms of the strategy. Most interesting in terms of the content is when he gives uh, uh, talks on the role of desire and craving and conceit on the path. Um, there's one case where this Brahmin comes to see Ananda, and he says, See, what, what is this path you're practicing? Uh, what does it lead? And, the, and Ananda says, it leads to the end of desire. And the man says, well, how do you approach that? And Ananda gives the list of what are called the four bases of power, and the very first one is desire. And the Brahman says, wait a minute, how can desire be used to put an end to desire? And Ananda gives an analogy. He says, it's like you're coming here to the, to the park. When you were, before you got here, you had the desire to come, right? Yes. Now that you're here, where is your desire? It's gone, because he's arrived. In the same way, you need desire on the path. When you've attained, attained the goal, then you can put the desire aside. Another more interesting one is there's this one where a nun has the hots for Ananda. And so she sends word out that she's sick. And wants have Ananda come and give a Dharma talk. And so Ananda comes and sees her, and she's lying there with her robe over her head. And he sizes up the situation pretty quickly. 
And so he says, you know, we practice so that we go beyond the need for food, but we need food in order to practice. We practice so that we go beyond the need for craving, but we need craving in order to practice. In other words, you crave the end of suffering, and it's a legitimate craving. We practice for the end of conceit, but we need conceit in order to practice. In other words, you see other people can do this, they're human beings, I'm a human being, I should be able to do it too. And that counts as a kind of conceit. And he says, we practice for putting the end to sexual intercourse, and there's no role for sexual intercourse at all. <laughs> and the nun gets up and bows down and says, I've been a fool. Please accept my apologies. And this, both of these suttas relate to that point made earlier about kawesan, in other words, using unskillful means to get to something skillful. If you're really skillful, you're like a good cook. I had a student one time who was a professional cook, and there was one time that oh, he was working at a, at a club in, in Singapore, and they had a pr fixed price meal, and they were supposed to have a par asparagus soup. And they had more people come than they, they anticipated. So he said, okay, everybody else, out of the kitchen. And he went into the garbage pail and took all the asparagus shavings out of the garbage pail, made a nice sauce bechamel, put the gar asparagus shavings in a blender so they were just very fine, and made a really nice asparagus soup out of the garbage. And you know, if you're really skilled as a cook, that's what you can do. And this is how you have to be skilled as, as a meditator as well. And Ananda seems to be the only person in the can who talks about this or brings this point out, but it's a really useful point in the practice. Another really interesting answer that he gave in terms of his content is, he's asked one time, is there a concentration where your five senses fall silent and you're still percipient? And Ananda says, yes, and he lists three of the formless jhanas. The point being here that, and this is a controversial point now, but it gives us a good answer to the, the, the issue that comes up. And when you get into jhana, do you still sense the world around you? And Ananda's answer is basically saying, yes. It's only in the formless jhanas that you might lose sense of your, of your five senses outside. But when you're in the, in the regular jhanas, it's not, necessarily part, it's not a part of the attainment. Um, most interesting in terms of the strategies that you, Ananda uses to answer questions, there's one point where he, he's asked the question, who practices rightly? Now for any Dharma teacher, this is a huge pitfall. So and so, do they, are they know what they're doing? No, nah, they know what they're doing. That's not how the Ananda answers. The Ananda answer says, if someone practices for the putting an end to passion, are they, are, they, are they teaching rightly or wrongly? And the person says, right. If they teach for the putting an end to anger and aversion, are they teaching rightly or wrongly? Rightly. If they teach for the putting an end to delusion, is it right or wrong? It's right. And Ananda says, you've answered your question. And the guy's really impressed. He said, you did not name any names, you didn't, say, it was a totally you know, objective. He says, how amazing, how astounding, that there is neither extolling of one's own dharma nor deprecation of another's, but just the teaching of the dharma in its proper sphere, speaking to the point without mentioning oneself. And that in, is kind of Ananda in a nutshell. He speaks the dharma, he's not trying to play, present himself as anybody special. But he uses the Dharma and he uses it in a strategic way, having learned this strategy from the Buddha, and then passed the strategy on through the way that he memorized and presented the Buddha's teachings in terms of who came to the Buddha with what question, how did the Buddha respond. And that way we get to get a sense of what is the meaning and the purpose of the Dharma from the human context. And that's our debt to Ananda. So, so those are my thoughts on the topic. Okay, well, thank you for your attention. Thank you for listening. To learn how you can support the teachers and Dharma Seed, please visit dharmaseed.org.